So you're watching the press preview. Take your first look at Sunday's front pages. And tonight we'll check out those headlines with journalist and author Rachel Shabby and the editor of Teesside Live, Ian McNeil. A very good evening to both of you. We'll speak in a moment. Uh, let's check out those front pages for you first, though. Here's the Observer. Contrasts what it calls the two COVID pandemics while Britain starts to emerge from lockdown. World leaders have been warned that unless they act soon, the virus will overwhelm South America, Asia and Africa in the next few weeks. The Express reports that the UK economy is on course for liftoff as the lockdown continues to ease and more and more people and businesses get back to work. The Mail lays out the three crucial upcoming dates on the path out of lockdown, which it describes as three giant steps back to normal life. Sliding in the mirror, claiming an exclusive with a story that the person who funded Boris Johnson's number 10 flat refurbishment is a Conservative Party donor who's given up to £200,000 in the past. Here's your Sunday Telegraph reporting that Boris Johnson is planning a multi-billion pound infrastructure programme for Scotland to undermine SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon and save the union. Scotland on Sunday also looks forward to Thursday's election with a new poll which says voters are split over the SNP's record on education, crime, Brexit, uh, housing as well. People highlights the plight of a Marvel Comics fan who's appealing for a superhero to come to his rescue with £200,000 to fund treatment for leukaemia. While the star leads with the possible outcome of the final episode of TV police drama Line of Duty, uh, that's due to air tomorrow. Jesus, Mary, Joseph and the wee donkey. The wee donkey making no comment it seems. Uh, and we're joined tonight by the journalist and author Rachel Shabby and editor of Teesside Live, Ian McNeil. Great to see you this Saturday evening. Thanks for being with us. Uh, let's start, shall we, with the front of the Observer, Ian. Uh, a Tory poll lead slashed as key elections loom across Britain. Those elections, of course, taking place on Thursday. And your neck of the woods is going to be uh, incredibly important, isn't it? And uh, Sir Keir Starmer was there today. Uh, yes, he was. I mean, and it's the third time he's been here um, yeah, um, during this election campaign. And you can see how important it is for both political parties, um, this by-election, which has been, uh, it's been a very long time since uh, votes have gone to the polls since the general election. And obviously this is being seen as uh, a huge test for both political parties, but in particular Keir Starmer with um, it being such a previous Labour stronghold, uh, a red wall seat, um, but with the Conservatives um, seen really as front runners, uh, given the other seats that uh, moved to the Conservatives in the general election in this area. So um, he's really got a fight on his hands. Um, and you can see that with the, uh, we had Priti Patel here on um, Thursday, and then Rishi Sunak came to Hartlepool on Friday, that both parties are really digging in for the fight to, to desperately try to, uh, to take this seat because. Uh, really, it would uh, shift the narrative away from the um, the the idea if, if Labour were to hold on to it that that, um, that the Tories were taking these red wall seats. Whereas, uh, if the Conservatives can consolidate those gains, it's really going to be quite important for them. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch, isn't it, Rachel? And I suppose the big question is, when it comes to Hartlepool, uh, what will happen to those uh, voters who voted for the Brexit party in 2019? Where are they going to put their votes this time? Well, that's right. That's the big question, isn't it? And I think, you know, there's two ways of looking at it, aren't there? You could follow the line um, of this uh, Observer front page story about how it seems that finally you know, all the sort of corruption and scandal stories that have attached themselves to the Conservatives and to Boris Johnson have finally had an impact on the polls with the Conservative lead uh, slashed with Boris Johnson's own personal approval ratings also taking a dive and with Starmer, surprise, not seen as corrupt while Boris Johnson is. I think 42% of the population, according to this poll, say Boris Johnson is corrupt. So on the one hand, perhaps that will have an impact in the Hartley poll. But on the other hand, you know, 
I'm not sure how much of an impact that Labour has made um, generally, nationally. It's been a bit sort of lacking in substance and inconsequential generally. And it's worth noting that the candidate, the Labour candidate, was imposed uh, by Labour HQ um, on Hartlepool. It seems against the wishes of uh, the local constituency party and uh, is, a, is a Remainer. Um, and we're looking at an, an area that, you know, voted to leave, but also sees that as a proxy for Labour being disconnected, out of touch, um, not particularly caring mm. about um, issues that affect the region. So, that could have more of an impact in the end. Yeah, we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on in a moment. Uh, but Ian, I'd like to get your thoughts on what your readers are telling you. What, what are they saying on the doorstep? So, are they saying that uh, the Conservatives uh, have had this Boris bounce, the vaccination program going very well, Brexit, of course, has been uh, delivered in a part of the world that really wanted Brexit to happen, or are they consumed by all the sleaze allegations? Um, it very much it seems to be the former, interestingly. So we've been out in sort of both Middlesbrough, Stockton and Hartlepool this week, um, gauging people's views. And it very much seems that people have, have made up their minds. And when, you, when we're asking them about the Sleaze allegations, that isn't something that is um, changing their mind. Or, as you say, the, a lot of them seem to think that the issue of Brexit has been sorted out. And if they are leaning towards the Conservatives, then they very much would like to see Boris Johnson given a chance. That's often the phrase that we're hearing, because they feel that he's been coming to government, he's been dealt um, the, the problem of the pandemic to deal with and still hasn't had chance to move on with the agenda that he was elected to carry out. Um, whereas um, Labour voters see it very much as confirmation of what they already think of Boris Johnson, as in someone who is sleazy and can't be trusted. So it doesn't seem to be making a huge difference to how people um, are intending to vote, which has been uh, quite interesting um, to see, because given the, the level of reporting that's been on it, um, the, um, that's how people have responded. Yeah, it is going to be fascinating to see what happens, uh, isn't it? Let's move on uh, then, Rachel. Scotland on Sunday, their front page, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, their voters split on SNP's record in government. Uh, another poll uh, 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 to talk about. Um, tell us about this. That's right. We've got another poll uh, for Scotland on Sunday. This one's saying that there, um, the perception, the negative perception of the SNP in government is over issues such as housing, crime, um, education and Brexit, but that there is overall a uh, favourable rating for uh, their record in government. Um, there's also a, a gender skew and an age skew, so younger women um, have much more positive approval ratings uh, for Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP than do older male voters. I think that's probably a, a split that, that we're quite familiar with nationwide when it comes to progressive or not progressive. Um, but it does seem like this week's election... Um, the SNP will win, but the by how much is the thing that's hanging in the balance with both Nicola Sturgeon and um, the pollster, uh, John uh, Curtis, saying that it is really on a knife edge. And of course, the size of that win will determine whether or not the SNP can then say, well, now we do have a mandate to go for a second referendum. Um, they have said that they want to do that, COVID permitting, by the end of 2023. And with a win, they could, with a significant win, they could then say to Westminster, well, look, we do have a mandate for this, so you now get, need to give us legal powers for it to go ahead. Yeah, there is a sense, isn't there, that uh, the vote could well be a referendum on a referendum. Uh, let's bring in the Sunday Telegraph. <laughs> Billions for Scots as PM bids to save the union. And Ian, uh, we're seeing tonight that another poll uh, in the Herald is saying the SNP could win a majority. So as Rachel says, it, it, it is on a knife edge, but clearly uh, the Prime Minister is, is concerned. Oh, it, it, without, without a doubt, it seems that uh, the, the amount of money that is being uh, projected in the, the Telegraph report is clearly being seen as something that, that, that they can try to hopefully sway voters before on uh, Thursday, planning to spend billions on road and rail links um, and 
treating Scottish patients on English NHS beds in what Telegraph describes as a desperate counter-offensive. So it, it, it's clear that the electoral landscape in Scotland is obviously hugely different to England, where you do have those red wall seats and um, the uh, traditional Labour voters um, have moved across to the Conservatives, whereas in Scotland that clearly hasn't happened and they've moved to, um, to the SNP. How many of those um, voters the Conservatives can try to get back uh, will be interesting to see. But like you say, it very much seems like a referendum on a referendum in Scotland. Um, and if the SNP do win by a landslide, what exactly will happen then and whether they will push forward for a referendum? The Telegraph talks also about how uh, lawyers have been asked to uh, sharpen their pens mm -hmm. to fight for any court attempt by the SNP for a referendum. So yeah, okay. uh, clearly um, the, the Conservatives as a unionist party will be uh, keen to, to win as much as they can in Scotland. Yeah, uh, indeed. OK, we will uh, park the politics uh, there for now. Uh, coming up after the break, could home testing kits replace the need for self-isolation? It's a story on the front of the Sunday Telegraph. That's coming up. You, Ian and Rachel are still with us, uh, front page of The Observer. Hopefully they're going to appear. There they are. Uh, Rachel, why don't you kick things off? Uh, front page of The Observer and two shockingly different pictures here. Uh, the clubbers in Liverpool last night having uh, a whale of a time on the left without masks, without social distancing, taking part in that, in that test for live events. And then on the right a hospital in Delhi, India. India, the first country to report more than 400,000 new coronavirus cases in a single day. It is stark, isn't it? It is stark, and it's, it's, it's kind of grotesque, actually, the disparity that we're starting to see, and that's what this Observer story is focusing on, the idea that the agonising scenes that we're seeing in India of people dying on the street and outside hospitals and car parks being turned into crematorium, um, that there is a risk of that repeating in fragile countries across uh, Africa, Asia and South America um, because of this huge divide that's emerging uh, between the global north and south. The global north is racing ahead with vaccinations, but in low-income countries, only 0.3% of people have been vaccinated. You do have to look at this globally and ask, where is the humanity in all of this? Um, it does put Boris Johnson's decision to slash UK aid by some four billion in a particularly brutal light, but it also raises the question of why have we not waived the patents on vaccines so that they can be produced and distributed globally. Um, India has only been able to uh, vaccinate 1% of its population. The UK and the EU are still opposed to those uh, waivers on patents, even though India and another 100 countries have, since October, been asking for those monopolies to be broken so that we can vaccinate the world. And you, you really have to ask why the UK and the EU are still blocking this. Uh, Ian, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, the, when you see those pictures from India, it is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and, I mean, it's it really does suggest that some sort of coordinated global effort may ultimately be required. I know the UK and the US have previously stepped up their efforts to support uh, countries, but in a way that we saw following the financial crisis of a coordinated global effort, um, whether we need to step that up, because really, until we're all safe, then sort of no one's safe, really. Um, we are clearly those pictures from Liverpool um, gladden the heart as we sort of Britain opens up and uh, we can do more things. But clearly, we've been here before where countries are moving at different speeds and we've had ourselves in lockdown and other countries even just a few weeks ago, crowds in India at the cricket matches. Um, we know how quickly things can turn. So I think if we can push forward with some sort of coordinated global effort, um, hopefully we can make the difference that really needs to be done. India is obviously the world's largest vaccine producer um, and it's trying to roll out to... 800 million people ultimately it's an enormous effort and clearly things are going badly wrong so 
Um, what other countries can do to help India really, I think, needs looking at. Yeah, um, and uh, on that theme of, uh, uh, of how different um, our country is compared to those poorer countries, the front of the Sunday Express says end of the nightmare, uh, the economy is on course for liftoff. Uh, also, this uh, idea of um, getting rid of, of um, self-isolation and, and, and better testing. I mean, our testing now is, is a completely different league, isn't it, Rachel? Well... What, what the government is looking at now is rolling out a pilot um, to, to see whether um, the requirement to isolate for 10 days, uh, if you're found to be in contact with somebody who has COVID, which is currently the case, whether that can be um, swapped for daily lateral flow tests to show that you actually do not have COVID. So there's a pilot that I, th I think is being rolled out next week. And obviously... That would be great if it worked, and that is the case that it's possible because it will have a huge impact on, you know, whether people can get out and about and go to work, etc. But we still have a big unanswered question of what on earth is happening with test and trace? Where did that 37 billion go? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a government a parliamentary committee earlier this year Rachel, said Rachel, I'm sorry, that, that question is going to remain unanswered because uh, we've got to... Uh, Head to the break. It's the end of the hour. But Ian and Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Ian, let's start with uh, you then. Front page of the Sunday Times. Uh, it's going to be busy in your neck of the woods uh, over the next few days. Uh, the Sunday Times headline, Tories Super Thursday jitters as poll lead narrows. We've got that by-election up in Hartlepool. Um, but the paper is saying that the Tories now only one point ahead of Labour, um, it's going to be fascinating, isn't it, to see what happens? It is. It's a particularly uh, tight race in Hartlepool, um, won by Labour only by uh, 3,000 votes last time, but um, with 10,000 votes going to the Brexit party. So where those votes will go in the general, in the um, by-election will prove crucial. Uh, obviously, reform, UK are standing, uh, previously was the Brexit party, but it's it's those votes that I think um, will be interesting to see if they will be Labour, so Labour former Labour supporters who voted for Brexit will go back to Labour or whether they'll make that leap across to the Conservatives. Um, we've seen that happen elsewhere. It happened in the uh, general election in Redcar. Um, and I think Teesside has been seen as a test case, really, for the Conservatives to really try to push... Uh, a wholesale generational change in how people um, see politics in areas of sort of post-industrial uh, Britain, um, with the announcements of things like the free port, the bringing of the treasury jobs, um, even in the budget itself, Teamside was name-checked as a place where um, got great innovation and great things were happening in the economy and as an area to be supported. Also, issues such as offshore wind, where they are supporting... Um, where, where new money is coming in and potentially new um, industries are being developed. But whether people will look to that uh, and think um, the Conservatives are delivering on their, their promise to level up um, will be interesting to see. And it really will be a test vote. We have the Teesside mayoral election. Uh, we have PCC elections. We have Hartlepool Council elections. The poor people of Hartlepool are voting four times. Um, but it really remains to be seen. Um, I remember when a man in a monkey suit won in Hartlepool, so you can't second-guess what the voters of Hartlepool will necessarily do. <laughs> Rachel, it is going to be uh, fascinating, isn't it, uh, to see what the people of Hartlepool do decide, because uh, Keir Starmer is up there uh, this weekend and he has been saying every vote has to be earned, and he's not wrong, is he? Uh, no, he's not. Um, I don't think anybody is taking uh, Hartlepool for granted. I think there's been quite a few Conservative ministers um, visiting the area as well. And, you know, I think Ian asked that crucial question of what will happen to those voters who voted Brexit for the Brexit Party um, and, and now their votes are to play for. Um, sometimes that can be a sort of conveyor that belt delivery system taking Labour voters to the Tory party. We've seen that happen in the past. Um, and I suppose the question is, how, to what degree all the sort of corruption and scandal stories we've had 
about the Conservatives in the last few weeks um, have actually made an impact. Now, the polling uh, suggests that it is getting through to people. The Observer is leading with an opinion poll about how the Conservatives have lost their, um, their lead is dropping as well. And they've also got uh, figures that suggest that 43%, sorry, 42%, apologies, of the population think Boris Johnson is corrupt. And uh, Starmer has much more favourable approval ratings when it comes to issues of trust and being seen as honest. Uh, but whether that actually makes a difference when it comes to voting, mm. that's still the question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. And let, let's ask that question to Ian then, because the front of the Sunday Mirror, Ian, uh, Boris's £58,000 wallpaper boss is a Tory donor. You know, the sleaze allegations are still all over the front pages. But what are people telling you um, in your part of the world, you know, when you, when you speak to your, to, to, your, to, to your readers? Do they say, yes, we are very concerned about these sleaze allegations? Or do they say, actually, the Boris bounce is working? You know, uh, Brexit has been delivered as we wanted. Uh, and also the vaccine is being delivered. It's very much a case of um, it's it sort of entrenching people's existing opinions of what they think about Boris. So if they already are a Conservative supporter or they are minded to support uh, Boris Johnson, then uh, these allegations often they see as um, sort of tittle-tattle, really. Um, however, the, there's a, another side where if people don't like Boris Johnson, it very much confirms their opinion that he is someone who will uh, play fast and loose uh, to suit himself. Um, what it doesn't seem to be doing is is really changing opinions, but more hardening them. Um, so um, it's. I don't think it's going to have a huge impact, although it's been interesting. It is being talked about more. Um, you had the issue to do with Greensill, which was clearly a, a highly complex uh, lobbying story to do with financing, whereas this is something much more tangible that people can uh, they can understand about who pays for his flat. Do the state pays for his flat? Does he pays for his flat? Does the donor pays for his flat? All the things to do with the wallpaper and um, those sorts of details, people can get a grasp on and can have an opinion on. So um, I, I guess it just fully remains to be seen, doesn't it, on um, on Thursday as to really how much of a, an impact it's going to have. Yeah, you're right. We should get that uh, uh, result from the by-election in the early hours of uh, Friday morning. Uh, let's move on then, Rachel. Front page of the Mail on Sunday. Uh, three giant steps back to normal life. Uh, May the 17th, uh, June the 21st, and then this week as well. I mean, it does seem, doesn't it, as if we are finally coming out the other side of this, uh, this terrible time we've been through. Absolutely, it does, and it's great, but it's interesting at the same time that both the Mail on Sunday and the Express have gone with these sort of cheerleader -y, um, we're going back to normal stories when you might think uh, that the continuing saga of Tory corruption um, might still be worthy of front pages. Uh, but of course, we all, we all welcome um, the easing of lockdown. Um, I've been enjoying... Uh, sitting outside in the absolute unreasonably cold weather uh, with a drink as much as everyone else. And I much look forward to um, further restrictions being eased. Um, all these are uh, contingent on, you know, the, the, the criteria being made met to ease, uh, but it does seem like we are we are heading in a in a very good direction. Yeah, near in the front of the uh, Sunday Express, uh, as Rachel mentioned, there end of the nightmare question mark economy on course for lift off. Uh, Hancock backs plan to get people going to work and living their lives. Uh, it's been tough on everyone, hasn't it? Um, in, in your part of the world, in the northeast, um, people will be will be looking forward to getting back their freedom as much as anywhere else. Absolutely. We've seen that very much this uh, last few weeks when uh, the pub gardens have, have been really packed, <laughs> whatever the weather, uh, where people have been able to get out, um, going to the gym or going shopping and just those returns to normal life. Um, when you're out and about, you can see the, the traffic returning to normal. Um, and it's just hopefully moving to those next phases and we won't be blown off course by any... Uh, any changes. I think the, the main fear is if a, a new variant appears, the vaccine programme seems to be 
uh, going smoothly, hopefully moving into people in their 30s um, very shortly. Um, and um, if it keeps progressing in the same direction, then, yeah, that sort of return to normal life and that relief that we can all have, really a move from just existing to living, that's how it very much feels in this area where people are really getting back on with their lives. It was interesting reading today, Rachel, that one uh, boss of a, of a major pub chain uh, in Britain saying that with patients uh, admitted to hospital and deaths falling faster than had been predicted and there being zero chance now of the NHS being overwhelmed, isn't it time to, to bring forward some of these dates? Yeah, you, you hear that. Um, you hear that. And certainly um, in Scotland, I think there are demands around the same theme coming from um, pubs and, you know, sort of ENTS venues as well, entertainment venues. And I think there are quite big disparities still um, nationwide. So there are some areas with very, very low infection rates. And so it does raise the question of whether we should all be you know, looking at the same sort of restrictions and the same, you know, at the same pace. But that also raises a, 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 you know, parallel concern, which is, are we going to see areas that have been suffering disproportionately throughout? So in particular, the Northeast, the Northwest, the Midlands, some parts of London, you know, places like Newham spring to mind. Are we going to see them just stuck with, um, bad infection rates and still struggling, um, while other parts of the country do start to see the benefits of the low infection and the easing of restrictions. Yeah, and let's just finish this um, uh, this part with that question, Ian. I mean, do you feel that in the northeast there has been a, a COVID divide? Do you feel that your your readers uh, get that sense? Oh, I think so. Yes, you've clearly seen throughout this that there have been areas where. There have been uh, particular hotspots for infections, um, and this has been one of them. And it, th those factors that feed into that are issues to do with poverty and housing. Uh, we have um, one of the highest proportion of key workers anywhere in this country, because you have people working in uh, industry, in uh, social care, in the health service. Um, and that's clearly had an effect on the high uh, infection rates we've had, uh, which has also therefore meant that We've been in uh, higher tiers, uh, faced higher restrictions as a result of that. Um, and those health inequalities that were here before COVID have been exacerbated. And really, this sh should give us an opportunity to look at those health inequalities as we come out of COVID to try to tackle some of those, because if and when the next pandemic comes, then clearly we'll be in exactly the same situation. And those are things really, you know, political leaders need to, to look at addressing. Yeah. OK, uh, stay where you are, because coming up, uh, the NHS plan to offer secondary school pupils a single coronavirus vaccine. We'll be discussing that story after the break. Hello again, Ian and Rachel still with us. Uh, we're looking at the front page of The Observer next. Rachel, two very different pictures on the front page. Uh, scenes from Liverpool this weekend, those clubbers all out enjoying themselves without masks, without social distancing, uh, in that trial for when things really open up. And then on the right, uh, a picture inside a hospital in Delhi where things couldn't be uh, much worse. Uh, and it's a real juxtaposition, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It couldn't be more stark, the disparity. And you have to wonder, you know, globally, where is the humanity um, in our approach to this pandemic on an international level that we've allowed such gross inequ inequalities in, in outcome and, and suffering to have evolved in this way? And the Observer is reporting that the absolutely agonising scenes that we've seen unfold in India um, could very well repeat themselves in other low-income countries, particularly in Africa, Asia and South America, because um, as the global north or the developed world uh, continues apace with vaccine rollout, uh, there is still very little access to vaccine in other parts of the world. It's still something like 0.2% of um, low-income populations have had access to the vaccine. And 
you know, this does raise the question immediately of patents. And it was back in October when India and a hundred other countries uh, were asking um, the WTO to drop the international patents on vaccines because that would allow countries um, that currently aren't able to, to actually start producing and rolling out vaccines. It is pretty appalling that that is still hasn't happened. And even worse, uh, that the UK is one of the countries that is still blocking any possibility of that happening. Uh, in uh, a quick thought on this before we move on. Just uh, clearly, it's absolutely heartbreaking, the, the scenes that we're, we're seeing. Um, and really, if we can look at delivering a, a global coordinated effort, um, which we haven't seen really in this pandemic yet, but clearly what affects other countries ultimately will come back to affect us as well. So not only in an altruistic um, gesture do we need to help other countries, but clearly it's also in our own self-interest as well. Yeah. Um, so. Yes, I think that's uh, that's what. Yeah, and just staying with you, Ian, uh, I want to bring the Sunday Times quickly because uh, again, you know, the contrast is is stark. But the NHS is drawing up plans to vaccinate school children, probably with a, with a single jab, which would make sense. Yeah, that's right. The, um, the Sunday Times leads with um, the health officials are drawing up plans to offer the the Pfizer vaccine to secondary school pupils from. Uh, September, the, the paper says it's uh, seen planning documents to do with this. Uh, it still feels like this is this is early days, but uh, interestingly that they're looking at a, a rollout in schools later this year. I think um, what you would want to see from this is uh, really coordinated planning on delivering the rollout of the vaccine if they are delivering it to children. What we saw in this area um, and spoke to head teachers when schools did return and testing was put in place, was that they were given very little notice um, and really had to plan a major testing um, uh, scenario from scratch. And if the more notice that schools can be given to, um, to, to plan for this, then clearly the better. OK, and finally, uh, Rachel, let's just uh, quickly look at this story in the Mail on Sunday. Um, uh, it's been a real problem, this, hasn't it? Dog napping. We know that uh, people wanting puppies has soared as a result of uh, lockdown and the like, but so has, um, has crime around that. And there's a picture there of a, of a dog that was uh, stolen from a 66-year-old man who was assaulted from behind by two men who made off with his pet. I mean, it's horrific. Yeah, it really is awful. As you say, lots of people have been getting uh, dogs during the pandemic because they are such good, you know, companions in lockdown. But that has also meant that the, the cost, the price of dogs and puppies has, has spiralled. So um, some can go for, some of the popular breeds can go for £4,000, which is four times the pre-COVID um, uh, prices. And this has created a sort of market for theft, dog thefts, which have become quite a problem in the country, and with um, Staffordshire Bull Terriers apparently being um, amongst the ones most um, eyed up yeah. uh, by yeah, potential This new uh, task so... force being brought in to try and uh, tackle it. Uh, um, we're going to have to leave it there, but Ian and Rachel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, enjoy the rest of the bank holiday weekend, and you're drinking outside, Rachel, for the next few days anyway. <laughs> all right, all the best.